Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be on small bowel obstruction, some new thoughts and concepts. And we've spoken about small bowel many times, looking at tumors, inflammatory disease. And in fact, within each of those talks, we speak about obstruction. But I thought I would um, address obstruction as its own entity, in part as I have to give a talk at a meeting uh, literally two days from now, which probably will be about eight weeks from the time I gave it to the time you hear this talk. But nevertheless, that's recording for you. And so a couple things in terms of small bowel. One is protocols are very critical. If we're doing dedicated small bowel, we're using a neutral contrast agent. Water is the most common thing we use. We will at times use volumen, but in patients with obstruction or suspected obstruction, you're not going to be using volumen typically. You can use positive contrast, and that works well. Oral Omni works nicely, but typically we reserve that for patients where we can't give IV contrast. And ideally, in looking at small bowel, you want to be giving IV 5 cc's a second of 100 to 120 cc's. Now, it's interesting. Small bowel obstruction can be an outpatient procedure. It could be an inpatient procedure. It could be an ER procedure. I always like to show these dumb things from ER medicine talking about contrast is unnecessary for most abdominal CTs. And this article goes on. What do radiologists know? Do they care that oral contrast will about two hours to an ED stay? And even when given frequently doesn't reach the cecum? Probably not. Well, we use water and ideally we wait about 20 minutes or so. So that two hour thing ain't gonna matter. And again, in terms of the contrast, IV is critical. Whether we use Omni or Visi will depend on the patient's uh, BUN and creatinine. Now, in terms of positive contrast, I mentioned that if we can't give IV contrast, we'll use positive contrast. And I always like to remind people also, the other time we like positive contrast is when we're worrying about a perforation. It's hard to see a perf and surely for leakage if you don't give positive contrast. Oral omni is inert, so if it gets into the peritoneal cavity, it's not causing peritonitis. And you can see here very nicely there's fluid around the liver, it's layering of the contrast. And when you look hard at the images, you can see there's a perforated uh, duodenal ulcer. Okay, very simple, here it is again. So this is really where positive contrast is ideal. If you're looking at fistulous tracts between different organs or different structures or the abdominal wall, wherever you're looking, if you don't give positive contrast, you can infer perhaps a fistula. When you give positive oral contrast, you can be very, very definitive about it. So that's a very important point to remember. Now in terms of water, what's very nice is patients who have uh, Bowel obstruction, the water's not going to harm them, not going to cause any problems. But also it does make the point in patients with uh, bowel obstruction, uh, there is lots of fluid in the bowel because it's obstructed. And fluid water is a wonderful, wonderful contrast agent for showing you transitions and for defining the causes of obstruction. Also, it shows the enhancement of the bowel. So in this patient with Crohn's disease, you see fiber fatty proliferation in the right lower quadrant. You see prominent vessels, and then you see the bowel. But you see the bowel thicken, but when you look at it in a coronal, you see the length of the thickening, the stricture, the prominent vas erecta, the comb sign. And as you go through the MIPS, the comb sign is even better seen. But again, with water as a contrast agent, the interface between bowel and vessels is much better seen, and it's really the ideal way to do the process. Now, I mentioned volumen. Volumen's good if you're looking for inflammatory bowel disease, perhaps a tumor or a source of GI bleeding. The problem with volumen, of course, is that patients often get diarrhea because of methocellulose, and sometimes clinicians have concern giving something like methocellulose if you do have a bowel obstruction present, because now you're bringing lots of fluid into bowel and you can make the obstruction or the symptoms for the patient worse. So in the acute setting, you're not gonna be doing volumen as a contrast agent. Um, this article by Elise goes through some of the different reasons why volumen works well. But again, CT enterography can be done with volumen or it can be done with water. Um, in terms of, as I mentioned, We'd still use water in the ER setting routinely. Again, it does not slow things down. Just make sure your techs are efficient and the patients drink it quickly. It's really not going to be a problem. Now, some people like this article by Albuse say, hey, 
in patients who have a little bit of more meat on their bones, a little more fat. The uh, oral contrast is not going to help all that much. But what I'm saying is we're not waiting two hours for oral contrast. We're waiting literally a couple minutes. And even if it's a, something as simple as giving them the water, getting them on the table, getting the topogram, all that takes a five-minute delay, you still will get rid of all the pseudotumors in the stomach and all the pseudotumors in the proximal bowel and will pick up more pathology in that scenario. So I think that becomes very important. This article, Glosser, Abdominal CT Without the Use of Oral Contrast, is accurate for making appropriate decisions by emergency physicians and general surgeons. Again, I think it's what you're looking for, the complexity of what you're looking for, whether or not you know the contrast is necessary. But I think people are making much more out of it than it is. It doesn't delay the study. It makes a better study. You get rid of a lot of pseudo lesions. You get rid of all those cannot excludes, or almost all those cannot excludes. So again, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. Now, I do make the point in terms of bowel, whether you're looking at positive contrast or neutral, you can miss things. In this case, this lesion was missed, which is a tumor in the small bowel. Uh, it was missed on the axials. When you do the reconstructions, it was much easier to see on the coronal display. And you can imagine when someone read the axials, they assumed it was an unopacified bowel. Now, just to make the point that when we rescan the patient, you see the mass again, but it's subtle on this no positive contrast study. You can see it because the mass is enhancing. And you can see that mass very nicely because it is indeed enhancing. You see the prominent vessels going through it. When you play a little bit more with the window, you can accentuate it, but you can see it can be very subtle. Now, in this case, the bowel proximal to it is minimally dilated. That can be helpful, and the MIP imaging, of course, was very helpful in this regard. So, again, making the point that technique becomes very critical and careful analysis is necessary. Otherwise, you can miss a mass like this, which is four or five centimeters. Now, in terms of protocols, dedicated small bowel gets dual phase imaging, arterial and venous. There's no need for non-contrast or delayed. We do thin slices, 0.75 millimeters by 0.5. And again, 64 slices or better, you're in great shape. The better the scanner, the better the imaging. But you're going to be fine with those thin sections. Again, you want to try to opacify everything. You don't want to be fooled by pseudotumors. Uh, so again, protocol, the vascularity is critical, 0.75 by 0.5. We routinely do reconstructions on all of these cases. And then probably you remember from our other talks, we look at everything from the axials to the multiplanars to the 3D imaging. And you can see a nice example here. You see a halo in the distal small bowel. That's a patient with Crohn's. And you see the length of disease a little bit better on the higher up axial or lower down axials. But then you say, what about the full extent? Look how much better the coronal is, because now you see the vas erecta very nicely. You see the extent of small bowel involvement, and you see the fiber fatty proliferation better. If you want to see this even better, just go through a thin slab, maybe 10 millimeters thick MIP. Look how nicely you can see the vas erecta, the comb sign, the thickened bowel, and here it is targeted down. This makes the point very clearly why water is such a wonderful contrast agent, as long as you can look at the interface and why IV contrast is critical because IV accentuates and opacifies the vessels and also gives you a really good look at the vessel bowel wall interface. Positive contrast will not, and just simply giving oral but no IV will not as well. And here's just a couple more images showing you nicely with volume rendering, the thickening of the bowel, the prominent vas erecta, and all the information you need. So let's get a little bit more specific with small bowel now. Good article worth reading in radiology. There are many articles about bowel obstruction. This one I think is the most comprehensive. Small bowel obstruction continues to be a substantial cause of morbidity and mortality. Up to 16% of hospital admissions for acute abdominal pain in the U.S. yearly. Typically, patients are treated successfully with NG tube decompression. However, other cases, the mortality goes from up to 8% to up to 25% if the patient has bowel ischemia and you miss it 
and you delay the diagnosis. So remember, it's very important to remember that with suspected ischemia, it is time that becomes one of your great enemies. You gotta do things quickly. You can't just be following the patient. CT is so good in including or excluding that pathology. And again, when you look at small bowel obstruction, it's the number one study for looking at obstruction. Very highly accurate. If you ask me the question, what's the cause of bowel obstruction, here are, the, here are the four most common. And if you break it down a little bit more, adhesions is way at the top of the list. And with laparoscopic surgery, you say, well, we're going to see less adhesions. The reality is that laparoscopic surgery also causes adhesions. And you have many choices because you have multiple trocars. And so adhesions, hernia, neoplasm is what we typically will be thinking about. Now, clinical questions, suspected small bowel obstruction. That's what the clinician says to me. Elliot, can you find, is there obstruction? And if so, can you determine a cause? So that's what you're, I'm answering. Does the patient have SBO or is the patient's symptoms related to something else? If the patient has SBO, is it partial and is it complete? If the patient does have SBO, can I determine its cause? And does the patient need to go to surgery or can we have medical management? So it's really critical cases. Well, when you think about bowel obstruction, we divide it into simple and complicated. Simple being intermediate or partial. Uh, it can be prolonged, can be complete, or can be high grade. Complicated, which are always surgical emergencies, closed loop, incarcerated obstruction, strangulation. It's really the real bad actors. Simple, depending on the situation, you could often follow the patient, treat conservatively. The complicated, that patient typically will be going to surgery. Now remember, surgery needs to make decisions. If surgery is delayed more than one day, mortality goes up to 25% from under 8%. And if you have strangulation, untreated means death, 100% fatal, okay. So now we're gonna look at the small bowel. What am I looking at? I'm looking for wall thickening. I'm looking for abnormal bowel enhancement, either increased or decreased. I'm looking for the position of the bowel. Is it in the right spot? Is there a hernia present? Is there malrotation? And what does the fat look like? The fat's often a good harbinger for me of local inflammation or in case of tumor, uh, spread of disease into that region. We talk about small bowel over 2.5 centimeters. I know that most of us kind of get stalted, and that's pretty reasonable, but you always need a number. We talk about a small bowel feces sign, which is air bubbles and intestinal content, proximal to a transition point for obstruction. I could show it to you better than I can explain it. We look at bowel wall thickening and we look for transitions. We're always looking for transitions in CT, whether it's stomach to small bowel, small bowel to small bowel, small bowel to colon. We're always looking for these changes. So a great example, markedly dilated small bowel with fluid. The loop more distal has just what looks like stool. This is when you have that uh, feces sign where the the content looks like stool, it's just model density and fluid and digested material mixed together, but that's the classic appearance. And when you see this sign, well, then you have to really know this patient is going to be obstructed. And when you look carefully at this, you can see the dilated feces sign and the other loop that's dilated. You can see it very nicely here. You see the mesenteric vessels. And as you follow the loop with the feces sign, you follow it to the right upper quadrant or right mid-abdomen, but the uppermost portion, and you see what looks like a transition right there. And in fact, that is the transition point. You don't see a mass, you don't see an interception, you don't see Crohn's, you see thickening. But this was a patient who had adhesions. And that's a classic look for adhesions. Adhesions, you see a sharp transition, you don't see a mass, you don't see abnormal enhancement. Beautiful, beautiful example. Another case, here we see bowel in the left upper quadrant. It looks like too much bowel up there. Also, this is a good injection. You see the vessels. Look at the bowel. The bowel is not enhancing, but the bowel is thickened. Also, look between the bowel loops. You see fluid. So now you have what looks like bowel loops that are twisted. Twisted to me is always ischemia. Here you don't have infarcted bowel yet. You have the dilated bowel, you have some enhancement. You can see it very nicely here. Here was that transition, the turn, mid-gut valvulus. Just a beautiful example of showing that.
And again, surgical emergency, no ifs, ands, or buts. Most of these patients have a lot of pain. Some have moderate pain, particularly those on pain meds. But you can see here, the bowel loops are displaced into a defect going through in the inside the abdomen. Now you have the loops that are thickened, inflamed, and you go from there. Another case, one of the things you notice from this case and the last one is the vessels are really well enhanced, good injection. But look at the bowel, the bowel is not enhancing. And look at it here on the coronal view. You see the branching of the SMA, but look how the branching tapers off quickly. It doesn't go far down, it just goes very proximal. And then you have the thickened, dilated bowel. And what you see what looks like is a transition point on the right side. And we look at it a little bit closer, there are the dilated loops, there's the misty mesentery, there's the small bowel vessels going to it. And here you can see it again. Now we don't see that same transition point we saw in the other case, but we know the in terms of uh, what we can explain is we can explain this patient has also an internal hernia. This patient is obstructed. This patient has a mid-gut volvulus as well. Look on the 3D cinematic, the loops of bowel in the middle. Look how different density they are, how fluid filled they are. That's a very classic example. And you can see, look at the vessels, look at the mesenteric arcade. Look how small the arcade is. Look at all of its appearances there and here as well. And this case makes the point, as many cases do, how the 3D mapping with cinematic works well. Here you really accentuate the bowel loops that are not perfused, the bowel loops that have the prominent vas erecta and the bowel loops with a thickened wall. The other bowel loops look like they're supposed to look. This is the area that's at risk. Now this idea about internal hernias, just a few more examples to get you used to them. You see a dilated loop of bowel in the right upper quadrant, far more dilated than anything else and is. And where is it? I don't know where it is. But then you look at it on the coronal view, and you could see that the patient has basically a volvulus. There's a twist there. You can see it here again. And that patient was obstructed. Now, closed loop obstructions can be caused by adhesive bands, internal or external hernias. A closed loop obstruction can lead to volvulus, which was the case here. So again, uh, it's something to really keep in mind when you're looking at the cases and coming up with a differential diagnosis. And this idea about closed loop obstructions, I have a bunch of cases because it's important for you to look that the appearances are variable, but they're almost the same. And sometimes you're going to miss it if you only look at axials. So for example, look at this case. You'll see on this example that um, when you start looking at the bowel, you see these dilated loops of bowel, which are right behind the stomach. And then you look a little bit more carefully and you look at the the imaging with interactivity, you can see that the loop goes be small bowel loop goes behind the stomach lesser sac and is now causing bowel dilatation and bowel obstruction. And you can see it very nicely here as well. I, I did this cases and you could see the interactivity. I think it's important to remind people, remind myself, remind you guys as well, that often things are harder to appreciate sometimes only on the axial. We've said this a million times, but making videos, the surgeons love them, everybody plays them. In this case, you see the internal hernia, the lesser sac. You see the stretching of the vessel, very nicely shown there, and also very nicely shown when you look at the sagittal view. So just a helpful hint, I think, Surely, if you want to capture all the information, it's much easier looking at things interactively. You could film it, but also, if you're not worried about filming, that's really not the issue. The issue is that you can see things much better. You can follow the loop, so interactivity becomes very critical. And here's just two snapshots which show you the dilated bowel, but you really appreciate in the coronal view kind of that whiskering, the, all of the vas erecta being stretched, the lack of enhancement of small bowel, uh, and here it is again. So just a very, very nice example of that, and that's something you need to look out for because if you miss this, the patient is going to die. Now, this was originally thought to be just simply distended bowel, but no, no, this was lesser sac. This was behind the stomach. This is going to be a mid-gut volvulus, very, very critical. And things are sometimes really subtle. This was a friend, a friend's uh, relative,
You see the loops of small bowel in the right lower quadrant? They look like they're, they have contained stool, that sort of um, feces sign again. And then if you look a little bit lower, you see a little bit of fluid in the right lower quadrant, which I can circle right there. But if you look at the coronal view, now look at that C. You see, you really didn't appreciate it because it was the wrong plane. Look at that classic C-shaped for a mid-gut volvulus where you can see the twist, you can see the loop coming and going. And here's just a beautiful diagram of adhesions at the opening to an internal hernia and the obstruction and the closed loop obstruction. So in this case, uh, you could see that very nicely. And this patient had repeated pain. It was only till we showed the reconstructed view that people believed us that was the classic coffee bean configuration. Very, very important that here it is again. Now, there are other reasons for hernias, or when we talk about hernias, there's other reasons for small bowel obstruction due to hernias besides lesser sac. We talk about inguinal hernias. Here's a large distended loop of small bowel, which we follow down into an internal hernia. We look at hernias that can be created by patients who've had laparoscopic surgery with trocars. We look at, at obstruction caused by hernias from surgical wounds. And again, things we look at are bowel enhancement or lack of enhancement, prominent bowel enhancement, and then transit through the images here. You see there's something by the right inguinal zone, and here it is, your right inguinal hernia. You'll follow it out. That'll be uh, resected. You'll see the, the enhancement there, which is typically going to happen. But again, it's this visualization that becomes very, very critical. And I mentioned sometimes in axial views, you can see the obstruction very nicely. But the fact is, I think it's by looking at all of the images, which is your best chance of finding obstruction. And so I'll leave you with this case. Here's obstruction due to a hernia. You can see it very nice. There's a hernia in the inguinal ring. Very nice example. That bowel loop is not coming out without surgical intervention. Something was necessary to do. So just a beautiful example there. And here's just... Um, couple more images from the sagittal view showing you as I circle it that hernia tracking forward. Just a really, really nice case in that regard. And again, to make the point, you can have very subtle findings, just obstruction, you don't know why. You better look carefully at the transition points. Hernias are not uncommon, and we used to think that because of laparoscopic surgery, we'll see less hernias. Truthfully, you probably see more hernias now. So again, it's something to look at very carefully. When you follow the hernia, does it go into the scrotum? Does it involve the testes? Does it involve the thigh? Is it compressing vessels? Those are all questions you want to look at indeed very carefully. So good example, again, of showing you another case of a uh, right inguinal hernia with a loop of small bowel going through the hernia and causing obstruction. So we talked about before about the uh, uh, transition points. You just got to follow things to the transition point. Even um, if it was read as negative, I think sometimes people underestimate. And if they didn't notice the bowel, they may not notice the pathology of what happened as well. So with that, let me stop here. So we spoke about a number of different things. We spoke about hernias. We spoke about bowel obstruction, ischemia, many things. So I think we should take a break here, come back in like 15 minutes, and take a look a little bit closer at bowel obstruction and some of the things we can learn and do as radiologists. And with that, have a great day. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.